Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest, live here in Austin, Texas, and I've had the gift of sobriety since December the 27th of 1972. The idea behind these podcast series is going deeper into the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, the psychology and the spirituality that underlie the program. Those are the things that have always interested me. It's kind of time to give back. So that's uh, what I'm trying to do here. Uh, if you haven't visited our website, please go to Two Way Prayer. You'll find there a form of uh, prayer and meditation that was done in the early days of the program and somehow got left behind and forgotten. And I think it's a really important uh, addition to an understanding of steps 10, 11, and 12, and kind of brings the program to new life. I'm hearing that from a great many people all around the world. So if you haven't done that, uh, make sure you do that. We're starting a new series here now. Last series was on a book that I'm writing on two-way prayer. In the final episode, it's on the chapter where I'm going deeper, uh, teach people how to, how to do the process, the history, the practice, and all that sort of stuff. But then I felt the need to kind of go deeper and look at what is it that's really going on in two-way prayer. And that opened me up to uh, going to William James, uh, Robert Johnson, uh, revisiting Carl Jung, and what the understanding is, particularly of the ego and how it is wrapped up in recovery. So we went pretty deep into that subject, and I think it is important, really important to understand it. When I first got sober, those were not happy days. Uh, I was at the Salvation Army in downtown Detroit. Things were not looking good, and uh, I'm going to AA. I wasn't sure that AA was really going to be the thing that I needed. It kind of, to be honest, felt like a bit of a cult. You know, I remember the first meeting I went to it was like, uh, well, Joe will drive you in this car. We'll meet at the restaurant then we'll switch cars and down the basement we went. And uh, oh, my God, what the hell have I gotten myself into? So uh, crazy times. And this is where the subject of, of this series uh, really started for me, because somebody gave me a pamphlet uh, by a psychiatrist. His name was... Harry Tebow, and the pamphlet was titled Ego Factors in Surrender. And surrender was what I was kind of trying to do. And, and man, there was a struggle going on. And I didn't understand the struggle. And reading this pamphlet began to give me some understanding of what was happening beneath the surface. So Tebow was a psychiatrist. Um, he was actually the first psychiatrist to kind of promote AA to the general public, and he wanted to also bring it to his fellow psychiatrists. So, uh, so I'm reading now uh, maybe some of the same stuff that's being said in the big book, but it's in a different language, and I needed to hear it in that language. It, it was tremendously helpful must have read that pamphlet a hundred times and next episode we'll, we'll go into it in some depth i did put a link to it uh in in this episode so you can go to the show notes and get a head start because uh i expect everybody to have read it a hundred times by <laughs> time next week rolls around so uh i didn't know much about ego or shadow or but i knew that i was kind of the victim so to some stuff that was going on deep inside of me and and I knew that that needed to be healed and treated if if I was going to find any sense of comfort uh, in, in my life. Let me talk, uh, or let me let, let Harry talk for himself here, uh, because um, in in this little quote I've got from him, it's from a talk that he gave, and uh, it's 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 about saying the same thing but in a different language. I think you'll get what uh, the point is here. So Thibaut said this, I well remember the first AA meeting to which I spoke on the subject of ego reduction. 
AA was still in its infancy, and I was speaking to a group that was celebrating its third or fourth anniversary. The speaker immediately preceding me told in detail of the efforts of his local group, which consisted of two men, as they tried to help him get sober and become their third member. After several months of failed efforts on their part and repeated nose dives on his, the speaker went on to say, finally, I got cut down to size and I've been sober ever since. When my turn came to speak, I used his phrase, cut down to size, as the text around which to weave my remarks. Before long, out of the corner of my eye, I was conscious of the man staring at me. I could tell from the expression on his face that he was amazed that he had said anything that would make sense to a psychiatrist. This incident showed that two people one approaching the matter clinically and the other relying on his own personal experience had both come up with the same conclusion about finding recovery. Both of us saw the alcoholic's absolute need for ego reduction. Uh, I remember years ago, a therapist uh, asked me, he said, Bill, what's the slang name that we use for a psychiatrist? And I said, well, we call him a shrink. And then he shot back, uh, and just what the hell do you think it is the psychiatrist is supposed to shrink? The ego. So the ego needs to be cut down to size. The ego needs to be el not eliminated. That's the mistake I hear over and over in 12-step rooms. You know, I got to get rid of my ego. No, no, no. You have to make the ego right-sized. I remember another guy was in treatment for 10 years, and he tells the story that his big question, uh, uh, going to therapy year after year after year, was, why me? Why me? Why me? And then after 10 years, he said he got his answer. Why not me? <laughs> So uh, this, 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 uh, this ego, when, when it is operating and blown up in, in, in large size or in small size, you know, it's poor me, poor me, poor me a drink. It goes either way. It's either inflated or deflated, but it ain't right sized. And that's what Tebow is, is trying to get at here. How do we um, get that ego to surrender and if you don't like the word surrender i've never been very fond of it it's 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 i'm I mean, okay with it but i know for some trauma people it's it's scary and such i i like to use the word aligned is the ego aligned with with the greater self that's what we talked about in that, that last episode is it right sized is it looking uh, for guidance uh, from a power greater than itself or is it the one source of all knowledge and wisdom and power and all of that? Because if it is, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall pr pretty quickly. So understanding this ego, I think it's critical uh, to recovery. And um, there's a kind of a running battle that's going on inside, deep inside, at the level of the unconscious. Uh, and, it, and it's a battle between, it's a spiritual warfare battle that's happening. Uh, and so I think old Harry can, can give us some insights into this and uh, we can at least uh, put his, uh, his information uh, in, into perspective. I thought we'd uh, start with an AA Grapevine article. It was written by uh, Bill Wilson. And this was back in, uh, let me see, I think it was 1966. It was on the occasion of Harry's death. Harry was very important in the history of AA, not probably terribly well known. We're going to get some education on this uh, in the next uh, few episodes. So here's what Wilson writes. It began like this. The year was early 1939, and the book Alcoholics Anonymous was about to hit the press. To help with the final edit of that volume, we had made pre-publication copies in multigraph form. 
one of them fell into Harry's hands. Though much of the content was then alien to his own views, he read our upcoming book with deep interest. Far more significantly, he at once resolved to show the new volume to a couple of his patients, since known to us as Marty and Grenny. These were the toughest kinds of customers and seemingly hopeless. At first, the book made little impression on the pair. Indeed, its heavy larding with the word God so angered Marty that she threw it out her window, flounced off the grounds of the Swank Sanitarium where she was, and proceeded to tie on a big bender. Grenny didn't carry a rebellion quite so far. He played it cool. When Marty finally turned up shaking badly and asked Dr. Harry what next to do, he simply grinned and said, you better read that book again. Back in her quarters, Marty finally brought herself to leaf through its pages once more. A single phrase caught her eye, and it read, We cannot live with resentments. The moment she admitted this to herself, she was filled with a transforming spiritual experience. Forthwith, she attended a meeting. It was at Clinton Street, Brooklyn, where Lois and I lived. Returning to Blythewood, that's the sanitarium she was at, she found Grenny intensely curious. Her first words to him were, Grenny, we are not alone anymore. That, that last uh, series I did was on transformation, on psychic change, on uh, what is it that has to happen deep within the layers of the unconscious mind of the addict in order for change to occur. And it comes in a variety of ways. I remember one patient of mine, uh, he was in a treatment center, he, he, he left just, just like Marty did. He went out and he got stoned and he woke up in an Exxon bathroom station and he looked in the mirror and he didn't know who was looking back at him. He came back to treatment, we, we readmitted him, and he was a changed man from that moment on. Something happened. That something is somewhat indescribable, but it is a shift in consciousness at the deepest layers of the, uh, of the unconscious mind, a shift. Um, and it's a humbling shift, usually. That's what happened to this guy at Exxon. That's what happened to Marty. I love the phrase, we are not alone anymore. The illness of addiction is a tremendous sense of cutoffness, separateness, not connected to. And this is an integral part of the recovery process that has to happen. This self that was alone, that was cut off, that, that was feeling hopeless, now has, a, and it may be a slight thread of connection to, to hope, but it's there. And that's the difference. It's exactly what happened to Bill Wilson. It wasn't just at Towns Hospital when he had his white light experience. It happened three weeks before then. It happened when Ebby showed up at his door and, and he saw an alcoholic who was as bad or worse than he was. And he found a ray of light, a ray of hope coming into his life. I want what this guy has. And an e egotist that he was will say, well, if this idiot can get it, surely I can get it. <laughs> so sometimes this ego plays uh, to our benefit. Wilson goes on. This was the beginning of recovery for, for both, recoveries that have lasted until this day. Watching their uh, unfoldment, Harry was electrified. Only a week before, they had both presented stone walls 
of obstinate resistance to every approach. Now they talked and freely. To Harry, these were the facts and brand new facts. Scientist and man of courage that he was, Harry did not for a moment look the other way. Setting aside his own convictions about alcoholism and its neurotic manifestations, he soon became convinced that AA had something, perhaps something big. All the years afterwards, and often at very considerable risk to his professional standing, Harry continued to endorse AA. Considering Harry's professional standing, this required courage of the highest sort. He introduces Wilson. Uh, he gets to know AA. He endorses it. He sees that it works. Uh, he doesn't understand maybe why in the beginning, but something's happening when his patients connect with, uh, with Alcoholics Anonymous, something changes in them. And he wanted to study what that was. I remember a psychologist who, who worked with me many years ago. Uh, he was also pretty early in, in getting into what, what's going on in AA and studying it and, and starting to understand what's beneath it, you know, and get, getting beyond the language and the, and the superficiality of some of this stuff. What's the psychic change really all about? And he said to me, you know, he said, uh, I, 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 I either had to admit because he saw it working with people, he saw, he saw them getting sober, and he was trying to get, get them sober through psychological means, and, and it wasn't working. And he said to himself, either I'm the worst damn psychologist in the world, or these people are on to something. And he wanted to know what was it that they were on to, and he began to study that. Marty Mann went on, she became... Uh, a, a great speaker in AA. Her story is in the big book. Uh, it's even, it's in, made it to the fourth edition. Women suffer too. Uh, I think I'll read a bit of that at the end of this episode. Let me, let me just kind of finish up with Wilson, Wilson's talk here. But, but no, I was talking about, about um, uh, Marty. Mar she went on, founded the Council on Alcoholism, wanted to get over the stigma factor that is so prevalent with alcoholism and with addiction, that this thing really is an illness. It's tr a treatable illness. And she worked uh, the rest of her life uh, trying to get communities to uh, take on the cause, to stop treating alcoholics like uh, uh, the scum of the earth and addicts too, that we're good people and we're suffering from an illness. And we need to understand that illness. And it is not an easy illness to understand. And that's what we're going to kind of dive into. So Wilson concludes, I could go on and on about Harry, telling you of his activities and in the general field of alcoholism, of his signal service on our AA Board of Trustees. I could tell stories of my own delightful friendship with him, especially remembering his good humor and infectious laugh, but the space allotted is too limited. Now, what Wilson doesn't talk about here is that he fell into a deep depression himself. Uh, in the mid 40s to the mid 50s, he was in the depth of despair, uh, clinical depression, and he went uh, twice a week uh, from his home down to New York City uh, and was a patient of Harry Tebow's. I don't know much of what went on in that relationship uh, that's uh, between him and Harry, and they're both now dead. And then he, he went on, he saw another psychiatrist, Francis Weeks, and, and did work there. So psychiatry, psychology, they have something to offer us, but, but the, those people have got to get it right. If they get it right, then they bring something really, really important to the table. If they get it wrong, then they tend to treat alcoholism and drug addiction as symptoms of some other thing. And if we can just find that one other thing, 
just like just like uh, for many years the church treated it well these 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 people are morally corrupt well no more so than anybody else although when you do get drunk you do wind up doing some things that uh, some of those churchy people might want to do but uh, <laughs> don't get around to doing <laughs> right so uh, he wrote a paper I thought this would be helpful to uh, read a little bit and and this was a a paper that he delivered to the American Psychiatric Association, 1949. So way, way back. A couple of paragraphs from here I want to read because I think it gives you some insight into where Harry is coming from. And, and he talks to these, so he's talking to psychiatrists and he's telling them uh, uh, some things that they're going to have to understand if they're going to work with uh, alcoholics and addicts. He said to them, two factors may account for the present state of affairs the difficulty that they were having working with uh, folks like us. First, the peculiar difficulties of the problem of alcoholism have discouraged psychiatrists from studying it with sufficient intensity. Second, the psychiatrists have labored under certain faulty theoretical assumptions that have handicapped them in coming to grips with the practical issues. As to the first point, the alcoholic is a difficult patient for psychiatrists to learn about and even more difficult to work with, I'd add. If the alcoholic is in an institution, he clamors to get out and usually succeeds since he is not psychotic. If he is at liberty, he seldom maintains a routine treatment relationship. In other words, <laughs> supposed to show up on Tuesday, doesn't show up on uh, Tuesdays. He seldom uh, maintains a routine treatment relationship. He thus affords few of the usual opportunities for deeper insight. Uh, by and large, we're not good candidates for in-depth psychological work. Some of us are. Some of us have no choice but to go there. But some of us can get sober. Uh, meaning not drink, not drug, and kind of sail along at somewhat superficial levels. In the beginning, I, I don't know that they knew that. Uh, they thought you had to do this thing, you had to do it completely. Uh, they were kind of surprised that uh, a number of people were able to get by with just enough spirituality coming at them, just enough ego reduction uh, that they were able to stay sober. Moreover, so this is, this is Harry writing to the shrinks. As a rule, he seeks help, the alcoholic seeks, seeks help, only when prostrated by liquor. When he's drunk, he calls. And then it's likely to be at such inconvenient hours that he is avoided as not only a most unpromising candidate for therapy, but also an out and out nuisance. In consequence, few psychiatrists have had an opportunity to develop a solid body of knowledge concerning the condition. We are difficult people to work with. We're very sensitive, easily offended. Don't think we need uh, the help that uh, some of our compadres need. And this, this is ego. This is ego manifesting itself in our lives. And this is why it is so important for us to have an understanding of the deeper dynamics that are at work. Because so often you'll see somebody come into the program, I'm doing fine, I'm doing great, I'm back to work. I'm working two jobs now. I'm trying to make up for all the other stuff. The ego is swelling, swelling, swelling. Boom. Disaster. What the hell happened? You know? Depression. Anxiety. What's going on? What was happening with Wilson for 10 years? Having a spiritual experience is not the cure-all for, for, for everything. It can start the process. But the shape of the ego, 
how it is manifesting in my life, my sense of self, that's all ego means, my sense of self, my sense of who I am, my place within the world, right? How large is it? Is it grandiose? Or again, again just as uh, dangerously, is, is it not sufficiently developed? You got to have an ego. Question is, is it right-sized or is it not? He says the second and perhaps more serious block to formulating an adequate working concept of the condition, alcoholism, may be found in certain erroneous assumptions concerning its nature. Although it is frequently stated that alcoholism is a disease, psychiatrists, as a rule, have not really accorded it that status, but have most often held it to be a symptom of some underlying condition that must be uncovered before rational treatment can be instituted. Psychiatrists and psychologists often come from, particularly uh, many years ago, we, we've made a good deal of progress since then. I mean, we, we can see it as uh, an illness in and of itself that needs to be treated. Uh, and if it is not treated, if we're just going for the underlying symptom, uh, the patient is probably going to die. He uses the example of a fever. The fever is a symptom of something that's happening inside the body. But you better treat the symptom to start with, or the symptom is going to kill you, you know? Now, are alcoholics and addicts grandiose, immature, some of those other things? I think we are, all right? I don't know that we're the only ones who, who, who are, you know? Uh, uh, I, I think many, many people are, there, but there's a huge difference. We had better get a handle on this damn thing, or it's going to kill us. It's just like the fever will kill you. If you're, if you're spending all your time, well, where'd this fever come from? You know, get the fever down before you die. Get the alcoholism, the drug addiction in check long enough so that you can begin to work on some of these underlying things. Do we have underlying things? Yes, we do. Do other people have underlying things? Yes, they do. What's the difference? If we don't deal with our underlying things, we die. We die. I had a um, counselor uh, many years ago. He said, Bill, if, if your goal is to become normal, forget it. <laughs> normal ain't good enough. If your goal is to become the typical American, if your goal is to become the typical churchgoer, forget it. If you are an alcoholic of the chronic condition, if that is so, some people can do it. They tend to bore the hell out of me. But some people need to go deeper. What that guy said to me, is, it's like you got an anvil hanging over your head. Never forget this description. You will, you will learn what spirituality means, what uh, real addiction recovery means, what surrender means. And if you don't, it's going to fall on your head. Alcoholics and addicts, you watch us. If we don't get it, we, we burn out. We're like shooting stars. Not too many of us rust out, you know, which is like what, what most people in, in, in the world tend to do. They don't get it. They don't go deep. They don't change. They're restless, irritable, and discontented and proud of it, you know. They're angry as hell, and they're hanging on to it, you know. Well, we better watch out for that stuff, you know, because that stuff can kill us. We, we've got to have that ego teachable, right-sized, in right relationship to other people, to true self, to the image we have of God. If we don't, 
off we go. While therapy directed toward the cause of a condition is ideal, total neglect of the symptom may result in ineffective therapy. The symptom itself may assume disease proportions. <sighs> that, that's, that's when and how addiction uh, came to be a treatable illness. And I got into it in the 70s, early 70s, first came in in 1970. Uh, and I've watched it change over the years, uh, not always for the better, in some cases for the better, but uh, it, it's very easy to lose sight of this thing. And um, I mean, I, I was at a treatment center uh, in Detroit, 183 alcoholic men, uh, it's called Sacred Heart uh, Rehabilitation Center. And it was... Um, there was some magical stuff going on there. There were some tremendous people working there, dedicated, dedicated people. I'll tell you, they were not there for the salaries. They were, they were there out of a deep sense of commitment to the suffering alcoholic. And, and you could feel it when you walked in. Councils on alcoholism, they sprung up all over the country. You know, Marty Mann uh, started started them. Uh, they got really big, maybe in the 80s or, or early 90s. And then they started uh, going away. Why? Government took them over. They lost sight of their mission. It all came to be about money. And, uh, and, and they lost sight of what they were there to do. And that's why I think going back to this original stuff, is to the original program is is so extremely important and and, and particularly uh when it comes to um two-way prayer uh because this is where ego watching needs to become an art it isn't just sit down listen to god write it down off i go a huge part of it is watchfulness watching yourself. You know, what one of the early pioneers said, if you don't watch, you won't know what the hell to pray for. So, and what is it that you watch? You watch for the state of your ego. Is it getting too big? Is it getting too small? Uh, if it's too big, there's grandiosity. If it's too small, it's inferiority. I can't do this. I want to put the covers over my head. I don't want to get out of bed. You know, I can't handle this. You know, it goes either way. You know, so we have to watch ourselves, learn to listen to the voices that are going on, coming from the unconscious. You know? This is why in, in the book, I, I'm going to have to go deeper into some of this stuff. I, I kind of wanted to keep it at the surface level so I wouldn't have to deal with this. Because in some ways, it is beyond my area of expertise. I know that. But, but it ain't beyond my area of experience. I got voices in my head. I had voices in my head when I was, uh, you know, trying to get that one year sober. And that voice of addiction was talking to me. Hell, I believed in that voice. I entertained it. I allowed it to come in. And it spoke loud and clear. You don't need this stuff. You can get the hell out of here. These people are crazy. You know, have a drink for God's sake. Just not so many, not so many. <laughs> you know, we all know that addict, you know, and then the mind gets kind of gray and uh, boom, I act on it, you know. So I need to watch and I need to catch it very early. So um, shadow work, uh, dream work. I think this is this is this is uh, really important if you're going to do the, really do the two way prayer practice inner child work to listen to the little kid who who got hurt and is stuck inside and is acting out and and wanting us to act out you know 
every time I'm inappropriate in my emotional response, if I can stop and look and ask myself, hey, Bill, how old are you right now? Inside, down in the basement, how old are you? And if I'm honest, that's why the four absolutes are important, if I'm honest, I'm five or six. I'm having a temper tantrum, all right? And, and, and I want to act out. I want to scream and yell and shout, but I don't. I stuff it. Well, we got to unlock some of those basement doors. And I don't know that unlock, this is what Tebow's about. He didn't know that unlocking them is going to solve them. The symptom is what's giving me trouble. It's the drinking. If I can't control or get the, the drinking under control, I'll never get to this stuff. And that's why I think William James is important. And uh, like we went to in that, in that last episode, uh, Robert Johnson and, and Carl Jung, they're, 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 they're showing us what is at work beneath the surface. You know, the conscious mind is maybe 10%, 90% of the mind is, is dominated, run by the unconscious levels of thought. And so these are what uh, we do need to get to. I wanted to end with Marty Mann. I wanted to read her, a little bit of her section from the, from the big book. This is on page 204 of um, the fourth edition. Because it, it's nice to know what happened to her after she read the book uh, and, and, and started working the program and it changed her. She was not alone anymore. When I entered a sanitarium for prolonged and intensive psychiatric treatment, I was convinced that I was having a serious mental breakdown. I wanted help and I tried to cooperate. She may be a little delusional on that one. As the treatment progressed, I began to get a picture of myself, of the temperament that had caused me so much trouble. I had been hypersensitive, shy, idealistic. My inability to accept the harsh realities of life had resulted in a disillusioned cynic clothed in a protective armor against the world's misunderstanding. That armor had turned into prison walls locking me in loneliness and fear. All I had left was an iron determination to live my own life in spite of the alien world. And here I was an inwardly frightened, outwardly defiant woman who desperately needed a prop, a prop to keep going. Alcohol was that prop. And I didn't see how I could live without it. Boy, ain't that the truth. I mean, this digging back into Harry Tebow stuff uh, resurrected some of those feelings for me. How can I live without this thing? What is life going to possibly uh, offer me when the only security I know is saying you got to take this away? You get to some of these feelings and you're getting down to where the unconscious is really at work. When my doctor told me I should never touch a drink again, I couldn't afford to believe him. I had to persist in my attempts to get straightened out enough to be able to use the drinks I needed without their turning on me. That is the great delusion of every alcoholic and addict, and unfortunately of too damn many uh, scientists and psychiatrists who, who work with us. You're going to try to make a normal drinker out of us. I had one who said, uh, you know, uh, she attends a, a number of uh, psychological association meetings uh, each year. And she said, most of the good discussions amongst those people happen at the bar. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting, right? Besides, how could he, the doctor, understand he wasn't a drinking man. He didn't know what it was to need a drink or what a drink could do for one in a pinch. 
It's like air. It's like air. I can't breathe without it. I'm going to die. Well, as we talked about last episode, yeah, yes, you are going to die. That part of you uh, that needs to die is going to die. Uh, and a new part's going to come to take its place. I wanted to live, not in a desert, but in a normal world. And my idea of a normal world was being among people who drank. Teetotalers were not included. And I was sure that I couldn't be with people who drank without drinking. In that, I was correct. I couldn't be comfortable with any kind of people without drinking. I never had been. Naturally, in spite of my good intentions, in spite of my protected life behind sanitarium walls, I several times got drunk and was astounded and badly shaken. She knows of what she speaks, hey? She talks a little later about these people that she met in AA. They knew what to do about those black abysses that yawned ready to swallow me when I felt depressed or nervous. There was a concrete program designed to secure the greatest possible inner security for us long-time escapists. The feeling of impending disaster that had haunted me for years began to dissolve as I put into practice more and more of the 12 steps. It worked. We have a physical illness that's going to kill us. We have a mental uh, blank spot that says, hmm, this one won't do it. And we have access to a spiritual solution to a mental and a physical illness. Those are the three. And, and, and each one has a really important part to play. Harry Tebow kind of set the stage for uh, the role of therapy in working with alcoholics and with addicts. There is a huge place uh, for them. Uh, Wilson uh, wrote about the, you know, the emotional uh, immaturity that, that he faced in his own life and how once he did get sober, he also had to deal with that. My belief, and this is, this is honest to God, most people can't afford a therapist and damn few can afford a psychiatrist. And, and, and there aren't that many psychiatrists out there who know what the hell they're doing. Uh, you know, not when it comes to alcoholics and addicts. The ones who do, God bless them. They're few and far between and, and they're extremely, extremely valuable. But I think two-way prayer is a form of divine therapy. It's an opportunity to sit down in the morning for 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever uh, you're able to allot it, and to listen to sanity, to listen to the voice of love, to heal the deepest parts of what are wrong inside of us and are going to be talking to us. And so we got to keep an eye on them. We got to invite them to the table. We have to give them a say. Uh, we'll get into that in another episode. Let them speak because underneath there is something that they want. You know, they want wholeness. They, they want um, fun. They want joy. They want peace. They just don't know how the hell to go about it because they're immature. And so the ego has a role in two-way prayer. It has a role in recovery. It's really all about huh, growing up. And uh, either we do it or um, many of us are going to die. So uh, heavy stuff. I, I know that. Um, so next time uh, I want to dive into uh, ego factors and surrender. It really saved my life. And um, I think uh, you, you're going to enjoy it. So you, read ahead. Uh, go to the show notes. You'll find a PDF copy of it there that you can link to, and uh, you'll be ahead of the game. So uh, thank you for listening. Hope this was helpful. was to me. <laughs> Taking me back to those old days. I need to remember that stuff. So God bless, and uh, keep coming back. Mm-hmm.